survival kits and one of the ta things we talked about we kind of went over the shelters already um, and I'll reiterate what the shelter kit was uh, so you kind of know how the system works but this is mainly so you can kind of take notes and understand that you're, you're tailoring your gear to your environment and your skill level um, so and it's inversely proportionate so if your skill level is down here the gear to keep you alive in an emergency needs to be up here and as you develop skills and learn what you can get from the wood line and learn what nature can provide for you, your skills are going to go up, your reliance on gear goes down. And eventually you get to the point where you could go completely primitive if you wanted. But I think after you know the Duff fiasco, we beat it into you that, hey, a tarp's much easier. Uh, so yeah, inversely proportionate. So when you're a beginner, you know, there's there, your, your basic needs are your basic needs, no matter what environment you're in, no matter who you are, doesn't matter, you know, race, religion, color, creed, nothing. Your immediate metabolic needs are you need to thermoregulate and you need to uh, bring in calories and you need to bring in water. So doesn't matter. Primitive, modern, however you do it, those are your needs. Uh, so we need to cover that as a minimum. Uh, and that's kind of the, the frame of reference I want you to keep in mind when we're building these type of kits. Reminder, as far as thermoregulation, that's your fire and your shelter. And I almost forgot to talk about this, but your first form of shelter is your clothing. You know, choose an appropriate clothing for your environment. Um, I teach a four layered clothing system. So you have a wicking base layer that wicks sweat away from your skin, you know, to prevent evaporative cooling. That's one thing that you need to think about. Then the second layer would be an insulating layer. So you're wanting to trap some of that. Um, that could be anything from, uh, you know, long johns, long underwear, or uh, all the way up to like a poofy jacket uh, or puffy jacket, whatever you guys call them. I call them poofies. <laughs> Puffies. I like poofy. Puffy or poofy. So that's kind of the insulating layer that's trapping some of that radiating heat that you're putting off, you know, that dead air space, and that, you know, provides some core temperature warmth. Then the next layer on top of that would be your durable layer. And that's kind of confusing terminology, but we're wearing our durable layer right now. Durable pants, durable shirt, something that's going to last in the woods. That's your durable layer. Um, and then on top of that, your outer layer would be wind or waterproof layer. And you do it layered like that so you can prevent yourself from overheating. That's the key. Uh, you can take on or, or you can put on or take off what you need based on what the temperature is, the environment, your rate of movement, uh, whether you're stationary in a camp, whatever. So that's your first form of shelter. And then of course you got accessories like hats, gloves, scarf, uh, appropriate footwear or barefoot if you want. Callie, not even paying attention. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to go barefoot or appropriate footwear for your environment. Probably you too, Rob. <laughs> yeah. And then of course, good socks. You know, that's, that's kind of a key thing is take care of your feet. If you're going to self-rescue, which you should try, uh, got to be able to walk. That's your primary form of shelter. So that's kind of where everything starts. Just a reminder, the shelter system we already went over. So I just want to go back over the components for a basic emergency shelter system that you can pack. Uh, and like I said, this kit in its entirety weighs about 12 pounds. And with your you know, 32 ounces of water, it's 15 pounds. <laughs> Aside from your four layer clothing system, you need something to sleep under, like a tarp, something to sleep on, which you can use some sort of ground pad. If you remember from this kit, we're carrying just a couple of compact, you know, heavy duty uh, 60, 55 or 60 gallon drum liners. You know, go about three mil if you can get them. A lot of times you can get these in dark colors, but gather up in these, fill them up, and then put them out as a mattress and that'll protect you from conduction, uh, conduction on the ground. So something to sleep on, then something to sleep in. In this case, I've just got a simple blanket. Uh, you could throw a small patrol bag in there. If you're up in the Northeast in the winter, you probably want a whole you know, system uh, that you can layer two or three sleeping bags together. You know, Depends on your environment. But the key thing is, is you have your four layered system. You have your uh, something to sleep under, something to sleep on, something to sleep in. I carry tent stakes and we talked about that in this system and of course the last thing is cordage. Uh, I got a couple different kinds of cordage, just some uh, bank line and this uh, Titan Survivor cord. This also has the monofilament fishing line in it, it has the, uh, the uh, wax jute and it has some brass utility wire. So that's other components that I can use uh, for food procurement, uh, utility purposes, a lot of different things. Fire. Fire to me is the 
most important thing you can do uh, and we were talking about this just a little bit so for me priority one is fire unless and this is a big unless unless there's a life threat if there is a life threat you know a life-threatening injury which may be why you're in this type of situation to begin with you need to address that you know you don't need to worry about getting a fire if you're gonna bleed out three minutes later you know you got to take care of life threats first then I think fire should be your your priority depending on, granted there'd be some exceptions like out in the desert you know possibly you probably need to think about water more but anyway without getting into the priorities um, so fire I think is the most important after first aid for life threats I'm not, I'm not talking about you know stub toes and things that are not going to kill you you know you can get those down the road way down the list uh, you can get to those so let's talk about like a simple fire kit a couple different ways to start fire and some emergency like I need a fire right now tender like if you fell into drink and you're going hypothermic and starting to lose cognitive function it's not the time to start looking for fat wood and all that other stuff yeah that's a great skill to have but what if you know you're only able to use what's within arm's reach because you've got an, a uh, uh, some sort of joint injury to where you can't get around so surefire method is to use a lighter big lighter you know in an emergency don't mess around You've got that as an ignition source, then a big, large ferro rod. This one's also from Titan, and this is also the same cordage as this. So I've got some extra jute in here that I can use for tinder. Um, but big ferro rods versus the small ones. The small ones are great for spares, you know, having it on your knife for a spare. Your primary one should be big. You know, if you think about when you start going hypothermic, you're starting to lose fine motor skills. Uh, it's really easy to function this uh, that's a lot easier than trying to function a small one, you know, when you really need it. So a couple of ignition sources. You can throw in some store-proof matches if you want. That's another great one. Uh, and for me, for my normal kit, I'll have solar because I'll use solar every time I can uh, because it doesn't take anything away from my other resources. Uh, but this particular emergency kit, like I'm probably not going to have a solar. I could throw a Fresnel lens, but that's in my wallet and he's going to go over his wallet kits. Uh, then candles are really overrated for emergencies or underrated for emergency survival. Uh, I carry them multi-use. I can use it for light. I can use it as, you know, kind of a passive nighttime signal with a little bit of light to do some stuff around the camp. If it's really wet and really nasty, I can extend my lighter by just lighting a candle, save the fuel in that, and I can use my candle to start or even dry out a tinder bundle, you know, get it dry, and then it'll eventually, after you evaporate the water off of it, it'll catch, you know, so I can use this instead of trying to hold a lighter for 15 seconds until the thing explodes, you know, uh, and it's a waste of a resource. And then these are really cool. If you guys haven't seen these, I'll pass these around, but this is the first aid pack. You guys are familiar with like cotton balls and Vaseline, you know, that's kind of a, a big one that a lot of people like to use. I like these because they're more compact and they're they're kind of a next level of that. They're in a little waterproof container, a little straw that's sealed on both ends, but it's also, not only is it, you know, your cotton, but instead of just being infused with Vaseline, it's infused with triple antibiotic ointment and a little bit of topical lidocaine. So I can use that for all my little, you know, lower priority cuts to keep infection away because that's a big problem as well or I can use it for tinder. You can use it for both. So it's a dual purpose, real compact, real small. You can put them in, in everything. Got a couple of ignition sources, a couple of emergency tenders that you can use right now. And then of course I can gather from the landscape if my situation permits, but at least I've got everything within arm's reach, you know, if I need it and need to get a fire right now. Fire, shelter, those two things are gonna help you thermoregulate. Um, now your next priority after that is going to be water you know you're going to need water before you're going to need food granted you know you're going to get hungry and it's going to suck but you're you don't need food for quite a while uh, a couple weeks you can go without it i'll go over my basic system for filtration and purification and i think that's an important point to understand the difference of filtration is just removing particulates to make it more palatable it does not make it safe to drink purification makes it safe to drink all right there is a difference so improvised filters are not making something safe to drink my system is pretty simple i carry a stainless steel water bottle and a nesting cup because i can use that to make char cloth there's all kinds of things i can do once i get a fire going but the primary purpose of this is a water container 
my primary method of purification is thermal. I'm going to boil it. When you go out, you should have, you know, at least a half a day's supply of water for a person. You know, like normally I'm, I'm going for at least two of these a day. In my normal packs, I carry two, you know, so I carry a full day supply of water when I go out. But for a small kind of emergency kit, I've reduced it to one bottle. I can source water and what I do is I'll take part of my signal kit, which is basically a three bandana system, and I'll just put that over it in the stream and that'll be my pre-filter, you know, as I'm filling it. That'll get rid of all the particulates that those, the fancier ones that you spend a lot of time on, they'll get rid of that. You know, where you run, you build the tripod and you run it through all those three stages. That's a lot of energy wasted just to get filtered water that you still have to boil. So. I don't waste my time with that. I'll pre-filter it with the bandana to get all the pine needles and everything out. And that's, you know, there's nothing wrong with eating those either. But then I will use that. I can put that right on the fire, get that to a boil. Now, it's not possible, you know, if you take out of the equation, you take out uh, altitude uh, because pressure does have something to do with it. But if you take that out of the equation, generally speaking, 212 degrees is all you can get water to go because it's going to go to the point of vapor at that point and it's going to start evaporating. Uh, most everything is dead around 165 to 185, but we don't have a way to measure the temperature of that water. Okay, so the reason that we tell everybody to bring it to a full boil is because that's the only visual indicator you have that you le you reached at least 165 to 185 because everything's going to start dying off so here on the east coast i did the math when we were talking about the class i can't think of it right now but even at the highest point this side of the mississippi the altitude difference is not enough to change the boiling point but about one degree so we're talking it boils at 211 instead of 212 you're still well above what you need okay so I'll bring it to a boil uh, just because that's my visual indicator that I've reached at least 185 because I can't just feel it, you know, engage it. So that's the only reason I bring it to a boil. If you continue to boil it, all you're doing is evaporating it. You're not bringing the temperature up. You're giving it more time at 212, but you don't actually need 212. If you've got time and you're more comfortable doing it, let it boil three minutes if you want. Uh, whatever you want to do, but you're probably going to be safe as soon as it comes to a boil because you've definitely gone past the 185 then from there if you want to add a little flavor you can throw some fresh pine needles in there and let them soak if you want to add flavor that's great uh, if it's got a foul taste I'll take some uh, charcoal from the fire uh, kind of crunch that up a little bit and throw it in there and let it sit about 15 minutes that'll absorb some of the taste and odor and make it more palatable neither of which are necessary for hydration uh, it's just your thing but that's kind of my system i just pre-filter with cotton uh you can use a t-shirt even don't, don't use your sock that's kind of nasty but you're gonna boil it but you know <laughs> use a cotton bandana pre-filter thermal purification bring it to a boil where you can see it you know you've reached enough of the temperature to kill you know all the stuff that's going to get you uh and from there, if it's not very palatable, I'll throw some pine needles in or throw some charcoal in there, let it sit, and then I'll drink it, you know, after it cools. Then you can start thinking about getting some calories uh, because you're doing a lot of work, uh, shivering in and of itself, maintaining your core body temperature, that's, you're burning a lot of calories. So for a simple emergency kit like this, I'm not going to plan on just going straight to primitive trapping, you know? Um, I would even recommend throwing in some of those emergency like bricks, calorie bricks, um, because it, it, it doesn't make sense to me to take no food out with me wherever I'm going. Uh, when I've got room, I could just throw that in there. Aside from weather stranding you somewhere, the reasons you would find yourself in a survival situation if you do some, some critical thinking on it. You're either injured and immobile and can't self-extract, or you're lost. Other than that, it could be a car broke down, vehicle broke down, you were lost in conveyance. It could be um, you're out of gas, in a ditch, in the weather, or the weather's too bad that you can't move. It doesn't make sense to move. So like, those are some of the really the kind of the top five reasons. So if I know that, then I'm going to prepare to prevent that. You know, so I carry a pretty substantial navigation kit, um, and I teach navigation, and I think it's important. I'm teaching it here. I think next month. 
Um, navigation is important, so have a map of the area you're going to. Obviously have a compass, then you'll need uh, pace cords. And if you've never taken a land nav class and this doesn't make sense to you, I highly recommend you do one uh, because that can prevent a lot of lost hikers out there in the national forests even. You know, people are dying every year just from simple getting lost 100 meters from the trail, you know, and they can't find their way back. Something preventable. And I like to carry pencil and paper. I can leave notes, I can take notes, I can make a little small map that tells me my, my direction and distance to my water source. If you're one of the military dudes and are used to using a protractor, these have the protractors built into them so you can get rid of that piece and just use this. What's also cool about this compass, this is Sun 2 uh, MC2, this is the one I recommend, the one I use. It has a sighting mirror that you can also use as a signal mirror. You can also use it, you know, to look at your face if you've got something in your eye or took a stick and you need to address that. Um, the other great thing about this is it has a really decent magnifying lens built into it for reading the map and that will actually light charred material and it'll light some tinder fungus uh, so that's your solar source that i would add to the fire kit a lot of different things just with this and if you add the paste cord um, these are you guys paste cord actually uh, and then i just added uh, another little toggle like ferro rod at the bottom just as an extra because I can, there's space there and I want to fill it. You know, it's like when you buy too big of a rucksack, you're going to fill every pocket and then you got 80 pounds on your back for a day trip, you know. But the pocket was empty, you know. <laughs> this space on this paracord was empty. So I put a, just a spare little ferro rod and uh, a little whistle for signal. Uh, and that's part of my signal kit, which we'll get into after. So my goal, if I get lost or injured and can, I'm going to take care of that injury and see if I can get myself mobile again. And I'm going to try to self-rescue, you know, because I have uh, a background in land navigation. I'm, 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 it's reasonable for me to expect that I can find my way out. If you're not skilled at navigation, I recommend you stay where you're at and get a lot of signals up. Make yourself visible so they can find you. Signal. Signal is for when you can't prevent it and you're stuck out there. You can't self-extract. Um, for whatever reason. So color contrast movement, high visibility, that's the things I'm looking for in a signal kit. So when you think about a signal kit, you've got basically some things to consider. You, you need daytime signals, you need nighttime signals. You need passive signals that are not, they're working for you while you're doing other tasks. And then you need active signals. You hear somebody, you know, a couple hundred yards away for whatever reason, you hear a vehicle, you hear an aircraft coming over. Those are your active signals. You have to actively do those. Uh, and you need day, night, day and night for those as well. What I recommend is your passive signal. I like to use three different colored bandanas. And then I usually in my own kit will carry an extra bandana that I use primarily for filtering my water. And this becomes my signal. But that opens up a couple of options to me. One, I've got three different colors. So it contrasts against a variety of backgrounds. I've also got this passive signal here that can be seen from the air uh, and seen if they're on that side. This is kind of hard to see even though it's reflective because it kind of reflects the color of you know what's in front of it so it kind of blends in uh, a lot worse than you think. So I'll hang these up and just make passive signals kind of up high and then allow them to kind of just flap in the breeze. I chose these particular ones because you know when I'm starting to get cold and I'm calorie deprived and I haven't had caffeine uh, my blood sugar's low, you know, I might forget some of this stuff. So this is just some reference material. So this has got, um, I think, uh, some survival tips. This one's got some knots if you need a little refresher. And that's got some first aid stuff on it. So I like these just because it's, it's a good, this is a way instead of carrying a book, you can carry just some quick reference things that might help you. You never know. Otherwise, it's just blank. So. It's kind of like that empty space on the pa on the uh, paracord here. Empty space, fill it with something useful, make it dual purpose. Um, so that's kind of my passive daytime signal. I'll set it up with the extra paracord that's there, and that has the reflective tape in it. That's also day and night passive. Um, this is day passive. Then as far as active signals, during the day, I could use a signal mirror. Just keep in mind that you can only use the signal mirror 
in kind of a southerly direction because you're reflecting the sun. <laughs> if the rescue is coming from the north, they're not going to see it because the sun's behind you pretty much all day in the northern hemisphere. But you know, you got a you got a 180 degree chance of signaling with that. And it's working good. Then as far as active night signaling, I recommend that you get a headlamp so that you can do function, do things around uh, the camp, but also get one with a uh, strobe function. And then I recommend you stock that with lithium batteries because they're gonna last you a lot longer and you're not gonna get a resupply. So you got what you got. So then I'll throw an extra set of lithium batteries in there in case you know I miss them that night and I need it the next night you know you don't know how long it's gonna be so be prepared as prepared as you can be and then of course be prepared to find yourself completely unprepared which is where all the primitive stuff comes in um, so that's your 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 day and night active and passive signals and then you have a universal signal which is your whistle doesn't matter day or night you can hear that so that's kind of your universal one you should always have some sort of little whistle where you can get it like immediately another technique i'd recommend is all of your signals your active signals need to be within arm's reach because you don't know when you're going to hear something or see something that you need to get a signal you don't want to take the time and miss your opportunity you know digging through your bag trying to find your signals this i'll keep in my pocket so that no matter what i always have a compass my first aid kit normally goes on my belt uh, so there's not much for first aid in here other than you know kind of preventing infection as best you can with these then i think you know as far as life threats i carry tourniquets in my pockets um, for that stopping that bleed that hemorrhage control i could also depending on where the injury is i can improvise tourniquets with one of these bandanas or maybe more um, one thing i will say about tourniquets and the importance of carrying it uh, the reason i carry actual dedicated tourniquets is because I'm not trying to improvise when seconds count, you know. Uh, some arterial bleeds, you could be gone within three minutes. I'm not trying to improvise in that three minutes, you know. Um, so I'll carry a dedicated tourniquet, but if this, if this is all I had, yes, I can make a tourniquet out of this. If I'm by myself, um, self-application of an improvised tourniquet is even more difficult unless it's on your legs. Uh, it's hard to do a one-handed tourniquet up high on your arm by yourself, improvised. But if I'm carrying a dedicated tourniquet, I can do that all day. Um, so that's one reason I kind of advocate the tourniquets, and Mark will get into that uh, tomorrow when he talks about wilderness first aid. Where's Mark? He's here. No, oh, the guy that's not here <laughs> is. Uh, we'll talk about that. But these are mainly for my signal, and I carry an extra one mainly for that. But that gives me four of these so that if I have a knee injury and I need to improvise a splint and I could probably improvise a crutch and get myself out of there rather than wait for somebody to happen upon me, then I'm gonna do that. But you know, I've gotta be able to tie two above and two below the joint. So that's why I want a total of four and I don't have to sacrifice shirts, you know. Like I, got, like I went in the woods and forgot my toilet paper, you know, your shirt gets shorter and shorter as the time goes on or your one sock or maybe down to no socks. So that's why I carry four of those, is so I can take care of a, uh, immobilizing a joint. Just another use for it. You take anything for like bathroom stuff? Like hygiene? Yeah, hygiene. You can, yeah. Throw your little toothbrush in there, travel toothbrush. Yeah. Keep yourself fresh. It, in all honesty, there, there would be a, a really positive, you know, psychological effect of being able to get clean and brush your teeth, do kind of some of your normal routine. It really doesn't take up that much weight. Uh, you could definitely put in some hygiene items, some camp soap, uh, a towel. Then I think there's one more thing in this grab bag. Make sure. Is that a flint and steel bag? That one? No, it's just got a patch on it. It's flint and steel. That way I know it's mine. <laughs> Because nobody can rip off Velcro and run off with it. <laughs> it's not made that way, it's science. Last thing, uh, just because it's one of the priorities I teach, is being able to repair your gear. Um, clothing, your primary form of shelter, it's a good idea to be able to fix that. Uh, you guys familiar with the Colder acronym? Colder, C-O-L-D-E-R. D-E-R, yeah, all the letters, use them all. So it's kind of what I developed my shelter system around. So the, the acronym stands for uh, clean you want to keep your clothing clean as good as you can out here uh, 
O is for overheating. You want to avoid overheating. That's why the layered system. Uh, L is for loose layers so that you can get those uh, those pockets of air trapped and warm those with your radiant body heat and that keep, helps keep you warm. Uh, D is for dry. You want to keep your clothing as dry as possible, which is why we have the shelters and the waterproof layer on the outside. Uh, then E is examine for rips and tears. And then R is repair as needed. So the colder acronym is, is what you need to think about. So I can use this for repair of gear. I can use this to patch gear. I can use it to patch holes in the tarp, holes in my waterproof jacket. Um, this also works as a tinder. If you shred it up in a tinder bundle, it'll burn about 10 minutes uh, once you get it going. So it's an emergency tinder. Um, a lot of different uses for duct tape. Uh, and is also, of course, one of the 10 C's you guys are probably familiar with. And then the last thing is I've got a couple of uh, canvas needles. These are actually leather needles. Uh, so I can repair my stuff because I carry a lot of leather stuff. You can use a uh, sail needle, you can use a canvas needle, whatever. I've already got it loaded with some wax thread on there and that fits right down inside this little compact roll. So I can repair gear with that. Knife. I would normally have this on my belt and then I have this belt knife, but that's what's in there. I would definitely have a good six blade full tang if you can, doesn't have to be. There's really not a task that I've needed. Uh, to accomplish in the woods that I couldn't do with a simple Mora. Uh, but I do like having, you know, kind of a heavier duty knife with a really good spine on it. Uh, nice and sharp, do the things I need to do. This kind of facilitates all the other priorities. Um, so a knife would definitely be on that, but I'd recommend it be on your belt. Any questions on that? I didn't notice, uh, I didn't notice how you actually grab the stuff out of the pack. Do you have it just kind of separated within the pack individually? Yeah. Um, I try to separate it by kit in the pack and just the bulkier items that I'm not going to need right away I'll put in the bigger pockets. But like I would have signals readily available where I can reach. And if I'm just moseying along doing whatever recreation I was doing that day, then I wouldn't worry so much about it. But if I'm starting to panic, I get injured, I get lost, like this is starting to get real. I'd probably take that off and I'll start putting signals where I can get them. I'll put a whistle where I can get it. Uh, make sure my cup is in my pocket, you know, things like that. The main thing to think about is, is what priorities do I need to provide for? Make sure you have that covered, either with skill or with gear. Now once your skill level goes higher, you don't need as much gear, but for a basic emergency kit, I think this is pretty decent. Air shelter, water, food. Those are your immediate needs. You need those to live. Everybody does. And uh, first aid. Navigation, you need those to kind of maybe prevent the situation altogether and get yourself out of that and then signal for when you can't do any of that. And then of course gear repair is a good thing. Uh, anybody have any questions over that? This is a 15 pound kit with full water.